Welcome back, everybody. This is part two of the kinds of conversations I love to have with Master Ron whenever we get the privilege to be in the same place at the same time. Only now I'm being incredibly selfish because I've had him for about 20 hours all to myself. So I want to pick up Mm-hmm. for the most part where we left off and we were talking about the value of life the yep. value of the the mind of the other half of the work so to speak mm-hmm. um and this may sound forgive me like i'm going off on a bit of a tangent but the value of life the perspective on that in my humble opinion on that, seems to be very different in the generation that has been born in the last 20 to 25 years. Now, a very weak, very broad, very generalized statement. Uh, How do you teach the value of life to an entire generation that thinks life has a reset button. Drop them in a war zone. Let them see exactly how much of a reset people actually get when they didn't do anything to deserve it. Make them watch the video from Ukraine, from Repent, and see all of the people that had their hands tied behind their back and were shot in the head by the Russians. Make them deal with the fact that bad people do bad things, and there is no recovery from death. Once again, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Okay. Um, By way of explanation, I had this very similar conversation about 15 years ago with one of my godchildren who was working in some think tank that was working both for and against at that time i think the the biggie was world of war Mm -hmm. um because a number of the groups that were funding their research were trying to in your youth to become soldiers so that death would not affect them and the argument for that was to train a soldier for whom death had no meaning the argument against that was that you're training an entire generation to be not even hardened to, but almost oblivious to the concepts of humanity. Yep. And so coming back to where you started this, which is drop them in a war zone, they've spent their lives effectively in a fantasy world of war, playing a game, looking at death, looking at destruction. Will it change in real life? They haven't been looking at death and destruction. Well, the the illusion of it. They've been looking at an illusion of it. When you have to look at it up close, when you have to smell the body that's rotting, when you have to smell the piss and the shit that the body let go when they died, when you have to look at the flies crawling all through them. There is no illusion. That's real. To a generation that has been brought up on the imagery, Mm -hmm. that has been brought up in the weird convolution of that which I see is real. Can the mind make the jump 
into the value of the real world that they've been hardened to. Yes. What makes you say that? There's a line that you have to cross to participate in war. And it usually involves the killing of another human being. It's the hardest line to cross, but once crossed, you can't ever go back. Understood. But you can learn to recognize when you shouldn't. When that's not an acceptable behavior, you can recognize the responsibility of the power that comes with the ability to do that. Again, very generalized statement, very broad, yeah. probably far broader than it should be. Then why does it seem that it's becoming easier and easier to pull that trigger in real life at a younger and younger age? Because it is. Because psychologically, they've been conditioned a certain way. It's a game. It's not real. Nothing's going to happen when you pull the trigger, you know, until they actually do it. But they are doing Why it. do they kill themselves most often after they've done it? Or stand in court and laugh about it. Well, you know, there are people that are fucking crazy. <laughs> okay. No arguments there. You know, I mean, that's just reality. What we've done... Okay. Yeah, I know I'm an old fogey. Okay. But personally, I think the worst thing we ever did to children was to hand them iPhones that they can play video games on because the single most creative process I had as a child was the ability to read and have fantasies in my head of the pictures that those words created. Great. That's what gave me all of the tools I use in my life. Agreed. Okay. They don't have fantasies in their head that were created wholly in their own head. They have what we've planted in their head and told them it was okay to have. We've taken the simple act of human interaction out of the game. Ooh. We've made it easy for people to ignore each other by picking up a fucking cell phone. I have been rude enough on occasion to tell somebody I'm talking to when they pick up the cell phone Either you answer the phone or you talk to me, but you don't get to do both. Because if you answer the phone, I'm leaving. Because it pisses me off that somebody thinks that responding to that particular bell instead of interacting with me as a human being is more important. Pavlov's dog. The phone rings, you pick it up and answer it. Bullshit. I decide when I'm going to talk to people and not them. You call me if I answer the phone is because I thought I needed to answer the phone. I have no obligation to answer the phone when you call me. Leave a message. I'll get back to you. If you don't mm -hmm. like that, fuck you. You're not intelligent enough for me to want to interact with. You said something about human interaction. Yes. So much, again, my humble opinion only, the very nature of what we do 
is human interaction on a scale that is intimate far beyond sex. Oh, yeah. Now, coming back to that uh, evolution as survival of that which adapts the fastest, mm -hmm. we, I'm observing mm -hmm. changes based on a whole new set of rules for interaction. Hive mind, yes, which is probably not a bad thing creatively, but it's a new form so, of interaction. Yeah, maybe, but here's where I kind of begin and end. When I got out of the military, I began to shoot competitively, combat competitions, you know, speed, accuracy, movement, mm -hmm. all of it, right? Real simulation. Mm -hmm. And the guy who established the Southwest Pistol League was a guy by the name of Jeff Cooper. Now, people that are, you know, in the gun world know who Jeff Cooper is generally if they had anything to do with, you know, competitive shooting. He wrote a book on personal defense. Almost nothing in the book talks about weapons or martial arts. What it talks about is the difference between being prey or being a predator. predator. Okay. Humans are predators, period. Our eyes face forward, we hunt. Okay. If a predator is not paying attention, another predator is going to get them. Okay. The first thing Cooper talks about in the book basically is not just being aware of your surroundings, but making eye contact with all of the people around you. Here, here. Because predators will make eye contact with you. Prey will not. It's a subconscious signal that you're prey if you don't pick your eyes up and look at people directly in the eye. Right? So you can imagine what I think about these dumbasses walking around looking at their cell phones all the time. Because if I was a bad man, they would be my prey because they're not going to see me coming and they're not going to have the ability to defend themselves when I get there. True. Okay. So put down a fucking cell phone. Make eye contact with other humans. The worst thing about this is that all of the socialization skills that occur when you're learning in school, the ability to interact with each other, to have conversations, to emote, to empathize, okay, all come from eye contact, observing the other human, looking at their facial and body language, okay, listening to their words or hearing when they're not saying, okay? All of that is what creates the ability to be an empathetic human. We have robbed a generation or two now of the ability to be empathetic by handing them a fucking cell phone so that they didn't bother us while we were driving the car. Ouch. Ouch. We have abrogated our parental responsibilities as a society by giving them video games to entertain them instead of expecting them to go play games with other humans and interact and build the ability to be empathetic. 
Now, the same arguments, however, or very similar arguments, were made with the great wonder box that was called the television. And I don't disagree with those arguments. I think that, that television got in the way some, but parents in my generation knew how to turn a fucking thing off. Or if and you if you didn't family. leave it off, as my father did on occasion, he just cut the damn power cord so that you couldn't turn it on. So I had to learn how to rewire the fucking TV. <laughs> So I could watch it when he didn't want me to. To some extent, it was also a um, family exercise because the TV was so rare. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one per household, not one per room. Yeah. So, you know, the, but the real object lesson is everything that we've done that is taking away from the human interaction during the development of years until somebody is 25, roughly, Okay. is the cause of the lack of empathy that you're talking about when you're talking about a psychopathic killer. Yeah. We bred them. Yeah. We have to figure out how to deal with them. It's our fucking fault. So, yeah, no, I'm not going to buy into the evolution. I'm not going to buy into the creative change. We fucked them up. We got to fix them. And the only way to do that is to embody the values that we believe are important. And at least in our own personal space, have expectations that they interact with us the way we want them to as humans if they can't go there if they don't want to go there they don't belong here that makes for a very selective group okay that's a hell of a lot better than being institutionalized because i like to beat somebody and they like to be beat Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. We don't have to accept everybody, and we shouldn't. Oh, I so agree with you. Okay. It should be a selective group. The people that are dangerous should not be tolerated at all. Okay. I'm sorry. You know, political correctness doesn't play. It's too dangerous. It can be. It sure as okay. fuck can be. So, <clears throat> yeah, I know. I'm a dinosaur. I'm actually older than you, so I, I can be one of the dinosaurs that roam the earth. But, you know something? I would rather be a dinosaur than continue to foster the bullshit that I watch for long. I lift my coffee cup to you. Maybe that's why I'm so determined to create a place before I become that ancestor that will be a harbor for those minds. A place in and of itself won't suffice. We need to have successors that follow the same taxonomy that we live with. Here, here. We need to have people that have the courage to call bullshit, bullshit. Bullshit. Who can embody our belief systems, the things that make us special humans. And we need to be reasonably uncompromising in this. Because if we don't, the entropy in our own community will continue. 
and there will be nothing left when the politicians get done with us. And now I, I am about to ask the controversial question. Yeah. Is it possible, and I didn't say I agreed with what's about to come out of my mouth, that the reversal of course that we're seeing in so many groups may be at the base of that? Yes. Is that healthy? No. What other paths are open? Well, if you figure that out, let me know because you'd be smarter than I am. That's why I'm asking you. You're smarter than I am. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but I still don't have an answer. All I can do is continue to embody my beliefs, be there for any of my children, and everybody that has ever been under my hand is one of my children. Be there for my leather family when they call on me. Be willing to <laughs> educate when asked. And always speak truth, at least as I see it. If I'm wrong, okay, I can be convinced that I'm wrong. And correct it. Find a different direction. Understood. Because I know how to be honest with myself. But, yeah. and to, you know, and unless people recognize the, the path that they have gone down with the complete and utter disregard for the basics of the humans involved is going to continue to dis disintegrate and fracture our society, meaning the leather society of the people that engage in kinky sex. The fracture is going to continue and at some point, there's gonna be enough justification for them to start putting us in jail again or in mental institutions again because you know these dumbasses don't know any better. And therein lay the problem. Yeah. Again, my opinion only don't know any better. Yeah. And won't learn or unwilling to accept that maybe they don't know everything. If I'm giving a if, 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 if I'm talking to a group and you ask me what my opinion on something is, you should at least have the courtesy to accept that it's my opinion only. Here, and here. that if you don't like it, you don't have to accept it. What you don't get to do to sit there at 22 years of age and tell me how I'm supposed to be doing it when I've been doing it longer than your fucking parents have been alive. Sorry. I know that seems a little bit, you know, testy and rude, but no. The Japanese have a thousand ways to avoid saying no. I only need one word to convey a full concept. No. Now, if I need to underline it a little bit, I can say, no, you stupid motherfucker. But I'm not going to avoid saying no. no. Okay? That's not who we are. We're honest people. We deal with our controversies honestly. We can have differing opinions. Okay, that's okay. But the set of facts that we work with, the data that we, in, that we include in our processes have to be based in rationality and science. I don't talk about neurochemistry 
out of my ass. I talk about it because I actually read the fucking books so that I could understand what I was doing to the human when I applied a certain level of stress. Uncle Sam's got some real good books on torture too, by the way. <laughs> you know, so, <clears throat> you know, let's apply some science to it. Okay, You don't get to have an opinion that's going to get somebody killed and expect me to accept your opinion. No. And that's the word that we need to be saying to these dumbass children. But we are in a world where A, science is a no-no. Critical thinking is unheard of. You can't be a leather person and not have critical thinking. Let's just start there. Okay? You can't have good judgment if you don't know how to critically think. We can disagree on our interpretation of facts, but facts are facts. One set, period. We have a whole, we, we have 10 years that says there is something called alternative facts. Well, I hate to tell you this, but ain't no fucking thing. Okay. You know, we have a whole bunch of theories. We have a few laws, but there really aren't very many. And science says that when you prove that a theory is incorrect, you correct the theory. So that you've yes. got the newest version of the set of facts that support it. Okay. Einstein was thought to be absolutely crazy that gravity could bend light until somebody proved it. Yeah. Science, the methodology. You know, I, I went to a, a, a lecture with Neil deGrasse Tyson one time. Right. Funniest some bitch I have ever Batman. listened to. Yeah, he's also brilliant. I'd fuck that man and Yeah, you would. And that's saying something for you. I'd fuck I'd, do, that I'd man fuck him in a heartbeat too. Or should I say I'd let him fuck me in a heartbeat? Whichever way it was. He's just too damn smart. And he's funny. God, is he funny? But he makes a very interesting point. Human beings have five, count five senses, right? A scientist has 36. There are 36 different methods to measure and quantify the world around us. So the dumbasses who think that their five senses trump the other 31 Sensors that scientists have are just that. They're dumbasses. One set of facts supported by sound theory that's constantly being tested for truth. And when it's proven to not be true, we move on to the next theory. And it keeps getting better and better. Okay. When... When we were talking last night, I was talking about part of what took me out of the educational system mm -hmm. as a professor. The era that, that was just beginning to happen in New Jersey, which is where I was teaching, mm -hmm. was beginning the era of not teaching thought, not teaching the ability to follow a question, because they, we were beginning the era of it is wrong to not question, but it is wrong to have the question. Because wrong to question means it's flopping around in your brain and you're just not supposed to say it. Wrong to even have it. Now that we are almost 40 years or two generations later mm -hmm. with alternative facts, science is bad, mm -hmm. teaching to the test, Values are an unknown. The ability to have conversation and interaction are all parts of a past. Mm -hmm. Where and how 
do you find or create? And I'm willing to say that that person can be reborn. Yep. How do you find that potential to say you have the ability to go farther? Not that you, I'm not even saying unlearn, but there is more to Learn. your conditioning. Yeah. There is now learning that goes with mm -hmm. that. When we are a a much smaller version of the world we live in. Where, how do you create that nugget? In my generation, they were there. You just own them. Yeah. Now that that glimmer of curiosity, that glimmer of I want to know more, that glimmer of I wonder what makes this work, that glimmer of self re reflection mm -hmm. of how far can I take myself all of that seems to have gone the way that we are going of the dinosaur mm -hmm. if that is true mm -hmm. what comes out of it as you said the adaption cockroaches that inherit the earth oh that was depressing well, you know, you asked the question, you got the answer. If 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 it doesn't change, humanity as a species will not survive. And in a million years, cockroaches learn own it. Because as far as I know, cockroaches are the only only species on this planet currently that can survive radiation, vacuum and submersion in liquids and are impervious to most chemicals designed specifically to kill them. To kill them. Okay. So <clears throat> humanity won't be here if we don't smarten up. That's the first thing. Now to the deeper question. by modeling the behavior of curiosity, by asking people questions and making them think and not letting them off the hook when they don't have the answer, making them go dig and come back with it. I'm an educator as well. Very seldom did I ever give somebody in one of my classrooms the answer to a question. I would say, okay, I know that's in the book because I read it. Go read the book, find the answer, and tell me what it is. I would tell my students generally on the first day of class, look, guys, your job in this relationship is to acquire knowledge. My job, because I was a CTE teacher, is to teach you how to use it. I can't do my job if you don't do your job and I'm not gonna do your job for you. So if there's something that you can look up, you need to look it up because if you ask me the question, I'm gonna tell you to look it up. And you see this blackboard? Every day there's gonna be a word on that blackboard. If I ask you what that word means, you better be able to tell me what it is. So they had to develop the basic skill of just looking up fucking dictionary word. Was it a start? Yep. Yeah. And that's what we have to do within our community, within the leather community. We can't give people the answer. We have to figure out how to make them look it up. You got to earn those nuggets. That's why we started on the bottom. Was there abuse involved in the system? Sure. Yeah. Okay. 
was it fair all the time? No. no. Okay. But you still had to earn the knowledge of what you were doing and how it felt to be on the receiving end of it and how it felt to be in service. Okay. Because the more you learned of that, the less likely it was you were going to be abusive of the people that you were working with if you became a tomorrow. But it also gave you the, the skills to improve it. Yeah. To polish it, yeah. to shape it. Yeah. To... You know, so, you know, yeah, I know that, that it's most likely that I'm, I've listened past the graveyard now hoping for an impossible thing. But as long as I'm alive, I'm always going to have that same position because I know that's what served me the best. I know that some of the people that I've helped to learn, learn the best from that. And I know that the people that taught me will be able to have pride in what I produce and the way I act. That's kind of important to me. I may not have had a long relationship with some of those people, but I owe them. They shared themselves with me. They gave me a part of their soul. You know, I better do something good with it. Jerry told me before he and Tom moved to Chicago, you owe me. And when you are done for someone else, what you believe I've done for you, your debt to me is paid. Never happened. And <laughs> I would like to think that I'm about halfway through the interest. This life, I ain't coming near the principal. Because it's never done. There's always going to be somebody who actually has just, you know, a millimeter of intellectual curiosity about what makes us work. And we're always going to take that and turn it into a kilometer when we're done with them. It's just how we how we work. It's how we have to work. It's the thought that has to drive us. Okay? The way we change it is not giving anything away. Make them earn it. Don't back down from them when they complain and whine about how hard it is and it's unfair. You know, sorry. I've got scars on my heart from things that I have done to people that I love that weren't right. I had to learn those lessons the hard way. I had to fuck up so that I could figure out how not to. You're here. But guess what? We're human. We learn everything by fucking up enough times until we learn how to do it right. Man does not learn from his successes. No. Man learns from his failures. Exactly. Your success yes. gives you the courage to fail. Okay. What I would like to have happen a little bit, even though I'm skeptical that it's possible, I would like to have other people learn just a little bit from my fuck ups so that they don't do it. Okay. I tell the kids there's a pothole right there. How do I know? I don't want you to fall in that pothole I did. Now, I'm not saying there aren't potholes down the road, but don't fall in that one. Yeah, and what I usually end up doing is, you know, I walk up to the hole and there's somebody down in the bottom of it saying, help, help, get me out. So I jump down in the hole with them and they say, what the fuck are you doing? I said, I've been in this hole. I'll show you the way. I'm I know out. it. Yeah, <laughs> I know it real well. Yeah, so, you know, it's, but it's a, a relentless dedication to honesty. openness, empathy that 
we have to model to be unaccepting of the bullshit. And if those children don't want to be around us because we won't let them get away with it, fuck them. They don't deserve our time. Let them go get some scars on their hearts and in their heads. And when they come back and ask us for help, we can go, are you serious this time? This time. Because you came to me and asked me this question before, and then you chose not to listen. Yeah. Because it was too hard for you. Have you learned enough to realize that maybe I can help you learn this? That's all we can do. But we can't keep placating. Won't work. Because they're never going to learn a fucking thing. More years ago now than I care to remember, because I'm going back at least 15. It's one of the few times that I got into conversations online. (laughs) I worked real hard to stay out of them for a lot of different reasons, mostly because my typing sucks. And uh, (laughs) it's too hard to type fast enough with accuracy, all the things that were popping around in my head. But I had a young man tell me that, uh, or at least I'm assuming, because he was constantly using he, so I made the assumption I was talking to a male, that values, manners, human interaction Mm -hmm. were signs of times long gone, no longer relevant in a world that operates on the microchip. Mm that uh, operates in binary Mm -hmm. rather than in the broader shades of gray, I guess I can say. Okay, analog. Mm -hmm. And I honestly didn't have an answer for him other than the fact that I may have to accept that brave new world as yours but i can't accept it as mine it's not his either i've worked in the computer industry essentially since i got out of the service went to programming school right after on the gi bill i worked with computers my whole life The people that I would hire were the people that knew how to look me in the eye and could have a conversation. Not the people that were the best programmers. It makes you very different than most supervisors. No, it doesn't. The number one thing that we are told as CTE teachers, based on surveys of industry, okay, is that the children that we're producing need to have soft skills. And in that list of soft skills is to be able to have a conversation, to be able to look me in the eye, to be able to acknowledge responsibility and assignment and to exercise care in the work and the team around them. So I feel sorry for the poor son bitch that you were talking to because he ain't ever going to get a good job in a high-end computer company because they don't hire on programming skills. Yeah, you got to have the basic skills, okay? You got to be a good programmer. The hiring decision is made on personality, on psychology. I hope to God you're right. I am right. My last full-time job, I was chief information and compliance officer for a real estate investment trust before I started teaching. And I wouldn't have hired anybody that couldn't interact, couldn't fit. 
and none of the the CIOs that I know would. The criterion is about team. If you can't be a part of the team, I don't need you. I might contract with a company that would hire you to just write code, but you're not going to be on my team and you're not going to be making big bucks. Because you don't have the skills to be on the team. Soft skills are the thing that get people hired. <laughs> yeah, you got to have the technical competence for whatever job it is that you're applying for. Okay, you got to have that. But when you're interviewed, it's entirely on soft skills at this point. Is it me or am I watching a whole generation that doesn't know them? Yeah, and it's not you. Okay. Thought I, did, I, I, I was like I said, wonder. you know, we put cell phones in their hands and they stopped learning this shit. Because they're more focused on the cell phone, keeping their eyes on whatever it is they're doing there than they are on the world around them or the humans around them. And that's why they're more vulnerable to all personal crime than my generation was because they're prey. They don't understand predator. They don't know how to be a predator. If you don't want to be prey, you have to not act like prey. And the thing that amazes me is these are things that we took for granted. You know, it it, it wasn't even a learned skill. It was pretty much given. It, it, it was damn near well, in the DNA. When I was a kid, I was, you know, it, at least in the summertime, I was expected to leave the house when the sun came up Get and out. not come back until the sun went down. For me, it was when the street light went on. Your ass better be coming in the house as the street light yeah. went on. So, you know, Go play with people. Go interact. Make friends. You know, do shit. Don't just watch it. Oh, ooh. I have no interest in being nice. I, mean, I have a great interest in being honest. Don't just watch it. interesting mantra for a new generation that has been that, that's they live through that yeah i've lived through that i've made a good living living through that i'm kind of people that that built shit that would enable a lot of this i'm not proud of it most of the time i'm proud of the technological skill that I have, but what some people have done with computer technology really bothers me because we have robbed people of their ability to empathize with other humans. And the parents of these children are just as responsible as the companies that develop the ability to do so. Ron, I'm going to I'm going to take you on a little side trip here. Okay, because of something, <laughs> this ought to be interesting. Because of something that fascinates me, and I'm going to begin this conversation by saying I don't necessarily understand it all, mm -hmm. but I am fascinated by not just the process but the end result. Mm -hmm. At least a decade ago now, a wonderful woman from. Massachusetts by the name of Mistress Sly, and I think you know Sly, uh, was part of this relatively new phenomenon, uh, second life being the one that survived the law, that is still surviving. I think there were a number of these interactive worlds. Second life is the one that seems to have prospered. And uh, the library was younger, 
and just whether or not I would uh, consider building a library on Second Life. I had not clue one. It wasn't going in one ear and out the other. It was so far over my head, I honestly couldn't understand it. Uh, we talked a lot. I still couldn't get it because my computer was a wonderful place yeah. and great one-handed reading, and then I had a life. The idea that it was it, the wonder box the, or for a new generation, was as real as going outside to mow the lawn mystified me. It's, oh, stop there. I don't accept your premise. I, I, I didn't say I understood it all either. No, now, it's, it's not that I don't understand what you're saying. It's I don't accept the premise that what they were looking at on their computers as real as enjoying real life. Put a pin in that. We're coming back to. Ten, about eight years later, a young lady entered my life that, that uh, was sent to me because of trauma. And uh, the man who said, go talk, you need a woman talk to talk to rather than a man. And uh, in guiding her through that and getting to know her, um, she talked more about the evolutions of Second Life. And... Uh, so in learning from her and through her, and then establishing the Athenaeum, the library has a stunningly gorgeous presence on Second Life. That is, uh, you know, a place where people can come and learn, which is the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've watched, which mystifies me, is what seems to be a blur of reality for some. Now, I say that to, when the, when the Athenaeum was first created, uh, a young lady who works with and technically lives in Second Life did a review of it. Now, I watched her, the, the avatar. Mm -hmm. The avatar goes to bed, wakes up, stretches, has coffee, picks out clothes, and goes to do <clears throat> whatever it is supposed to do that day. Yeah. Now, that's a wonderful little thing if you're, for me, if you're watching this as a movie, although it seems to be taking an awful lot of time, mm -hmm. it's sort of like watching the Truman Show. Yeah. But in talking to her, which is where I think I had the disconnect because she wanted to talk to Jessica as the creator, but also to me as the person who owned the library and the inspiration and blah, 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 that put it on second. Yeah. She is firmly, and I say is because as far as I know, she's still there, rooted in the fact that that is her. I want to get it, not to agree, but to simply understand. And I can't come into the idea that that avatar that she is manipulating is who she is, even an extension of who she is. What am I missing? Well, you know, the first thing that I would say is this is a deeply, deeply disturbed and unwell human. But there's a whole world of them there. Yeah, well, that doesn't change the fact. Okay. okay. Because if that's the only safe place they can be to them, you know, they're very unwell. Well, it isn't even safe. 
It simply is. Well, okay, but that's collective. As an in, if you look at the individual that's participating, if you look at why they're participating, okay, what's the driver of that much of their life being invested in that, okay? I would be willing to bet if you get down to the very root of it, the base of it is that they don't feel safe in the real world. They don't have the tools to emotionally cope in the real world. That is by definition of the, the at least the DS, last DSM I read, which is the diagnostic manual. Five, for, right? Yeah, it's up to five now. I think I last time I looked, it was I was all four. I have a copy of four. That's the very definition of a very unwell person. Just that simple. You know, they're not dealing with reality. That is, I'm sorry, not reality. It's the reality that they feel safe in, but it is not reality. Is that what we are progressing to? No. Um, because I look at things like uh, one, one of my kids insisted that I look at uh, a movie called Ready Player One. Uh, and I've looked at others like that as they're talking about the brave new world existing in the metaverse. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not going there. I, I, you know. We can't go there because without people functioning fully in the real world, that world can't exist. Does it not or can it not, not like a uh, nanobot create itself? No. And nanobots can't create themselves. Yeah. Okay, I am a major fan of science fiction. And if you look at science fiction, good science fiction, it's based in science. Science, science fiction has pretty accurately predicted most of the progress that we have made okay. as humans, starting with Jules Verne, Voyage to the Moon. Mm -hmm. Okay. At some point, we will get to molecular printers where we can print any molecule that we desire based on the base components and particles involved. We'll get, because we're already doing it, just not at that level yet. Agreed. Because we have 3D printers, okay, which were predicted mm, 30 years ago in science fiction. I just said 40, but. Okay. Or 40, yeah. Well, they, they, they actually kind of had. Roddenberry, if nothing else. Yeah. So, yeah, and they, they called them replicators. Correct. And now they, they actually call them what they are, is 3D printers at the molecular level, right? So science eventually will progress us along the way. If we don't fuck up and kill ourselves with it, which is entirely possible, okay, yeah, we might have nanobots that can replicate themselves that deal with all manner of ailment and whatnot. Doesn't matter though, because that's still at least 100 years away. 
even with the accelerated rate that we are developing. I was about to say, doesn't Moore's law contradict that just a no. little? Because if you think about all the things that have to be present for that to be possible in the real world, mm. okay, being able to create a computer that is functionally capable of executing those level of specifications. True. True. At a particle level, basically, okay, it is going to take some time. I'm also the guy, and I can say this because it's my profession. Okay. When I started working in computers, okay, literally, think about this. See this right here? This has more computing power than all the computers that existed in the world. I'm, I'm aware. Okay. Because when I, I started at this. I still have punch cards that my mother used to have to make for yeah. RCA for the IBM computers mm -hmm. that ran them. And they were at 30 Roth, they were on two full floors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember. So <clears throat> I've watched computer development. I know that we've finally gotten to some micron spacing in our circuit, printed circuitry. Okay. I think we're down to quarter nanos, something like this, quarter micron, basically. That's not small enough because you're going to need pretty much all the computing power that's in my iPhone to fit on that nanobot. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's particle level shit may not be possible is what I'm saying. 45 years ago, what was in your iPhone was on, was in five floors of a building. Yeah. Well, okay. But we knew that it was coming because we had transistors and we knew that we could improve them. True. Okay. It was just a matter of learning the process. True that. We don't have anything that's some micron particle level. That's, we can't even see it. With the, the most accurate imaging system that we have, okay, can't get there. We can see structure, but it's still the level of measurement is too long. Is it because we don't have the machinery or because we don't have the imagination? Both probably, but you know, when you're measuring things in electron microscope, okay, the, the, the level of your measurement depends on the length of light that you're measuring with, the wavelength. And yes. The smallest thing you can see is the smallest wavelength that you can Measure. produce. Yes. Okay. We don't have the ability to produce anything better. Yet. Yet. Okay. But how long it took us you know, if even if you take, you know, say that every year we, we get eight times smarter, which is not true. Okay. Projecting into the future, the number of things that have to be accomplished to be able to measure a quark accurately and see it in real time. Okay, just think about that. It's a particle that's included in atoms. We can't see atoms. Till we can actually see electrons and neutrons and nuclei, forget it. Because 
the machines that you're talking about have to be even smaller than that. Yes. And there is a limitation at this point on the wavelength of light that can actually function. But there is no limitation on the brain that is going to make adaptations until they can get to that point. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. You know, it's an interesting side thing. I, you know, I, 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 I have a lot of fun with, you know, taking the science fiction that I'm reading and trying to, you know, imagine what's possible. Okay. But there's nothing there. Okay. There is no science that says we can go faster than the light yet. Yet. There's some theories, but nobody's figured out how to test them. So they're not really theories. Agreed. Okay. They're hypotheses. When somebody actually managed to test the accurate theory, okay, now if it works, we have a theory that it will require some significant refinement. Okay. All that being, you know, the, the only thing that humans need to worry about, in my opinion. Okay. And like I told you last night, opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. Most of them stink. Okay. Is that the most important thing we need to be focused on is other humans. The tools that we use to interact affect the interaction. We need yes. to make sure that our interactions are pure, that we're making an emotional connection with the human that we're interacting with, that we can empathize with that human, that we can be sympathetic, that we can be supportive at a real level. Okay? Put a pin in that. A year and a half ago when the library did its conference, one of the workshops mm -hmm. that uh, we had on the bill dealt with alternative worlds, what the kids are considering alternative worlds. Yeah. I can't even remember the name, two of them that, that we were looking at. And what prompted it was uh, one of the many times I had my Pearl sisters over, two of them were playing what I would consider a game. They were in the process of building their world. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, as I'm watching the screen, they're getting visitors who I know are real people because I knew them mm -hmm. to their little world. Mm -hmm. And they're interacting that way and interacting in ways that I almost couldn't wrap my brain around because as I'm watching one of them building their island and building a dungeon mm -hmm. on their little island with the cute little building blocks and it struck me as just adorable, mm -hmm. uh, the avatar of somebody else is bringing them toys for their dungeon so that they could play in the dungeon that was being built and to so, them it was real so let's go to the way we use language okay because i think that's the real issue here i don't play you um, i will understand they're not toys their tools. tools understood there's a difference between playing and working if you're serious understood. you work if you're not you play because the danger of the work is the same as the danger of the play except that i know it's dangerous they don't they don't We need to recognize that we've fucked up the language that we use to describe what we do, who we are, 
and how we feel. In one of the worst things that we did was this bullshit called power exchange because there is no exchange of energy or power. There's a grant of authority from one person to another, and that grant is only valid for as long as the person continues to grant it. They have the right to revoke, to revoke it that any time. And you better have the self-control to honor the revocation. Now, I would agree with the exchange of power. I don't completely agree in the exchange of energy because I think as the two, we are taking each other somewhere. But that's our pheromones, our emotions, yes, our biochemistry interacting. Yes. Okay. We can use those words to describe it. Okay? Yes. We can learn to manipulate that stuff. But it's not a fucking power exchange. I'm right? willing to give you energy power now. You know, it's just not. I'm sorry. How one describes the world shapes the world that they perceive. Here, here. Okay. Language matters. Okay. We need to somehow get them to understand that the that language and all of the impacts of the psychosocial loading of every word that we use has a direct impact on the psychology of the humans that are using it. And how we perceive it. Okay. If we don't accept that words have a imprinted impact on our minds, and change the language that we're using, it's just going to get worse. But that, sir, is societal. That's mm. not just us. So? What? I love you. <laughs> we don't talk about this shit because we enjoy the mental masturbation. We talk about it because it's a fucking problem. Yeah. And it needs to be solved. You asked me, how do we yeah. solve it? One of the ways is by teaching a language that is consistent. And common. Yep. That has one meaning for a word. And we understand the impact of that meaning. Because we all have a collective imprint on us. From the word from each word that we learn here, here. as a human, okay? And those words have, oh, I'm trying to think of the word. Young talks about it all the time. Um, it'll come to me eventually, but I'm getting old. I can't remember the word sometimes. I know the concept. Archetype, there it is. Okay. Every word has an archetype. Here, here. Okay. If we don't recognize that and avoid words that are corrosive to our interaction, we're doomed to fail. We have to recognize that the taxonomy of what we do and who we are is affected by the words that we use to describe it. Right? Is it inconvenient to have to learn this, this particular language and to have to take that level of care with the words that you choose to use? Yeah, sometimes it can be really fucking inconvenient. Because most of the time, you got to admit that you were fucked up when you did whatever, because, oh shit, I didn't intend that, but that was the effect that I got because of this. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we can fix it, 
but the only way we can fix it is by requiring those that choose to interact with us to learn the language including the full dictionary of how the language works on us. And if they don't want to put that much effort in to keeping the humans that they choose to interact with safe, fuck them. And on that note, we will soon be going to part three. <laughs>